This is Mount Rainier, the tallest volcano in the lower 48 states in the United States. It is an epic mountain that possesses a great risk to Seattle and surrounding areas when it erupts. This mountain is called Tacoma and other names by local native tribes. It is worshipped either as a holy place or as a god. This connection to nature has long been connected to non-Western or Asian cultures. But before the introduction of Christianity, European peoples had very developed and complex beliefs that involved some aspects of nature worship. One of these beliefs were, was practiced by the Vikings called Paganus, or what they called Asatru. For the rest of the video, I will use information we have about the pagans or heathens using Old Norse, but some of the terms will be in English, German, or other sources. Also, my pronunciation will be bad and I will try my best. Also, I will refer to the old religion as paganism to avoid confusion with the modern as a true religion. I will bring it up in a later video. With all, all that out of the way, let's move on to the history of what we know of Norse paganism. To discuss paganism, we need to talk about the Vikings, or the Norsemen living in Scandinavia, Iceland, and Denmark. These people were Germanic and spoke a language called Old Nordic. They have lived in the southern parts of Scandinavia since the 5th century BC, and remained isolated from the Romans, unlike the German Slavs and Gauls to the south. During the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the Vikings joined other Germanic tribes like the Goths, Vandals, and Visigoths in ransacking the empire. After all the gold and treasures were brought back, the Vikings formed nations such as Northland, Sweden, and Denmark. Vikings also controlled North France as the Normans, part of England and Scotland, as well as settlements in Greenland and Iceland. The Vikings were always at war and their religion suited this mentality. Let's go over the beliefs of the Vikings. More specifically, let's look at how the Vikings view the world and the gods. To begin, Vikings believed in the beginning of time, where there was only two areas in space, one being Messelhelm, which is full of light and fire, and Nephilim, which was full of darkness and cold. To separate the two regions, there was a void, Ginnagagap. When the two regions met over time, a giant that was in Nephilim, called Ymir, appeared. Mankind appeared from the giant's armpit, and from its legs, other giants came forth. These giants, such as Burgolmir, and others drank from the milk of the great cow Adabla. Adambla found salt in the rock, which it licked down to reveal the first god Buri. Buri's son Bor eventually had three sons, Odin, Vili, and Vi. These three gods decided to slay Ymir, the giant, which killed all the giants except for Burgomir and his wife. From Ymir's body became the world of the humans. The bones, the mountains, the blood, the water, and the flesh, the dirt. From his skull set up the dome of the earth. There was also dwarves who formed from scars of Ymir's wounds to hold up the skull. Time also began when orbs for the sun and the moon were put in chariots to circle the skull dome. Odin, who was in charge of the realm, made two giants, Sol and Mani, the drivers of the chariots. He also created two wolves to chase them to make sure that they don't stop moving the chariot. This was just one part of Ymir. Now let's go over the nine realms of the cosmos. Connecting the realms is the giant tree Yggdrasil, which holds and connects the realms together. The realms themselves are Asgard, home of the Asir, or the gods, Afhelm, the home of the Isofar, or the dwarves, or dark elves, Nidovel, home of the Dwarves who work with the Dukflar or Svlaflar or other dark elves, Midgard or Earth, Jotunheim or home of the giants, Vanahelm or home of the Vanir or the gods associated with fortune and wisdom, Nephilim, the ice realm, and Mespelhem or the heat realm, and Hell, the home of people who died dishonorably, ruled over by the goddess Hell. 
Now that we have gone over the realms, let's talk about how the pagans worshipped and how the religion was viewed by the people. To the Norse, the worship of the gods was to be amongst nature. They had many sacred woods and groves, but there was cases of pagans building temples such as the Temple of Uppsala, which was built in a holy grove. The images of the gods was very important as well, and effigies of the gods would typically be taken into battle. Animal sacrifice was very common and mostly consisted of bloodletting and then a feast of the animal killed, which was typically horses or pigs. The meat was considered good enough for the gods or elves and was typically eaten outside, similar to a barbecue. Beer and mead were typically drunk as well. This ceremony was called blot. Human sacrifice was also practiced, typically on slaves or prisoners of war to the gods in the sacred groves, which was unfortunate for them. To go off on a lighter note, the Norse would have major festivals in spring, summer, and winter, the most popular being the holiday Yule, which was celebrated around two months with drinking and being merry, decorating the Yule tree and burning the Yule log. Vikings viewed their gods differently depending on the village, and great men and women could carry the same reverence as the gods in many cases. Some historians believe that many of these gods may have been great men and women from long ago. All these traditions are to worship the many gods of Norse paganism. Let's learn about the gods and other great creatures in the Norse religion. The Norse believed in many gods and goddesses that held many roles and influence over everybody's lives. Let's go over some of the more famous gods. Odin is considered one of the great gods of not just the Norse, but also over the Germanic peoples. He is associated with healing, death, knowledge, battle, magic, poetry, and warrior spirit. He's depicted as one-eyed and having a long white beard. He also had a cloak and carried the great spear Gungnir. He had two set of pets, the wolves Geri and Fiki, and the ravens Hugin and Mugin. He also has the amazing eight-legged horse Slepnir that can fly in the sky. He is married to Frigg, the goddess of foreknowledge. Odin rules over Valhalla, who sees half of the warriors who die in battle honorably. The other half go to the great goddess Freya and her land Folkvanger. Freya is the goddess of fertility, love, sex, beauty, war, and death. She rides a chariot pulled by two cats and keeps the great boar Resingamen as a pet and uses a cloak of falcon feathers. Nord is the goddess of earth. Tyr, the goddess of war, and most notably is the god Thor who is the great god associated with thunder, lightning, storms, oak trees, strength, protection of humanity, and male fertility. He is the holder of the great hammer, Molnir. He is the husband of the goddess Sith, but he also had many lovers. He is described as having red hair and beard and very fierce. He is also a son of many of Odin and the goddess of the earth. Also well known is the god Loki, who is the father of the goddess Hel, the wolf Fenir, the world serpent Gormungir, by his aptly named goddess of sorrow. If any of this tells you anything, Loki has had a very interesting life. He is also a shape-shifting god, obviously, who will either trick or help the gods. Hemdel is the great god who waits for the end of days, or Ragnarok, and watches over the great rainbow bridge, Bifrost. What is Ragnarok? Let's touch on that. Ominous prophecies and dreams had long foretold the downfall of the cosmos and of its gods and goddesses along with it. When the first of these prophesied events came to pass, the beloved god Baldur was killed by Loki and consigned to the underworld. The gods had to face the fact that they could no longer escape their tragic destiny. They prepared as well as they could. Odin took a great deal of time and care selecting the ablest human warriors to join him in the final battle against the world-devouring giants. But deep down, they knew that all of their desperate actions were in vain. In Midgard, the realm of human civilization, people abandoned their traditional ways, disregarded the bonds of kinship, 
and sank into a wayward, listless nihilism. The gods weren't exactly innocent of these same charges, however. They had broken oaths and fallen short of their expectations of one another on many occasions. Three winters came in a row with no summer in between, a plodding, devastating season of darkness and frigidity which the prophecies had called the Fimbul Winter. At last, the pseudogod Loki and his son, the dreaded wolf Fenrir, who had both been chained up to prevent them from wreaking further destruction in the Nine Worlds, broke free of their fetters and set about doing precisely what the gods who had imprisoned them had feared. Yggdrasil, the great world tree that holds the Nine Worlds in its branches and roots, began to tremble. The far-seeing Heimdall, the watchman of the gods' fortress, Asgard, was the first to spy the vast army of giants headed for the celestial stronghold. Among the gruesome mass was the god's fickle friend Loki, and at the helm of the ship Nagalfar, Heimdall sounded his horn, Jaller horn, to alert the gods, who were no doubt alarmed and despairing. The giants set about destroying the abode of the gods and the entire cosmos along with it. Fenrir, the great wolf, ran across the land with his lower jaw on the ground and his upper jaw in the sky, consuming everything in between. Even the sun itself was dragged from its height and into the beast's stomach. Surt, a giant bearing a flaming sword, swept across the earth and left nothing but an inferno in his wake. But like the heroes of a Greek tragedy, the gods fought valiantly to the end. Thor and the sea serpent Jormungand slew each other, as did Surt and the god Freer, and likewise Heimdall and Loki. Odin and Tyr both fell to Fenrir, who was then killed by Vidar, Odin's son, and Avenger. At last, in the ultimate reversal of the original process of creation, the ravaged land sank back into the sea and vanished below the waves. The perfect darkness and silence of the anti-cosmic void Gwynangagat resigned once more. But this age of death and repose did not last forever. Soon the earth was once again raised from the ocean. Baldor returned from the underworld and the gladdened land became more lush and fruitful than it had been since it was created the previous time. A new human pair, Lif and Lithrasir, the equivalents of Ask and Embla in the Norse creation narrative, awakened in the green world. The gods, too, returned and resumed their merrymaking. Though the story was just about the gods, it seems that paganism as a religion would face a similar fate as the death of the gods when Christianity started to be introduced to northern Europe. How much did Christianity change the pagans? Or how much did the pagans change Christianity? Let's explore that in the next video.